Okay, hi everybody. Let's let's wrap it up tonight with the talking about tomatoes, and I'm going to give this talk. So I'm my name is Tom Kolb, and I am a horticulturist for North Dakota State University. My background is I am from uh, I was on a farm in Minnesota, where we were had a commercial apple orchard, and we raised about 15 acres of vegetables, including tomatoes. I support the horticulture activities out here, especially in the western part of the state. I'm based in Bismarck, and I coordinate the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials, and I also help assist with the North Dakota Junior Master Gardener Program. So let's get started and start talking about tomatoes. Beautiful tomatoes. Wow, they are so lush. They were so, in the old days, they were so beautiful and luscious that they were, the Puritans banned them because they looked too sexy. Did you know that? And then there's that old belief that they were poisonous because they're a member of the nightshade family. But Thomas Jefferson and other gardeners dispelled that myth. Tomatoes are wonderful in all kinds of foods like pizza and pasta. And I just like eating cherry and grape tomatoes by themselves. So let's talk about how to grow them, starting with the, the best varieties. I think the best varieties are early because we have such a short growing season. We want our tomatoes to be productive. We want them to resist diseases naturally so we don't have to be using the toxic fungicides. Of course, we want them flavorful and we want them to grow well here locally in North Dakota. There's all kinds of tomatoes out there. There's Oh, there's black and green and gold and red and yellow and there's round ones and pear shaped ones. But when I look for tomatoes, I first of all, I look at the vine type. There's two major types of vines, determinate and indeterminate. The determinate ones are compact and bushy. They stop growing once the flowers start to appear and set fruit. You don't prune them and you don't have to trawl them if you don't want to, but they do, do, they do well when they're staked or caged. They'll give you an early yield and a concentrated yield. Now you can grow the indeterminate types too here, but that vine never stops growing. It can be six feet tall and they must be pruned. They must be trellised. The benefit about an indeterminate type is it has an extended growing season, uh, extended harvest season. So I, Maybe someday when I retire in Florida, I'll grow more indeterminate types. These are some of the most popular varieties in North Dakota. Early Girl is popular, especially because it's an early ripener. Celebrity is popular because it resists a lot of diseases. It has a, a good quality fruit. The number one uh, tomato variety for growers in the Midwest is Mountain Fresh Plus. It's has a beautiful crack-free fruit and it's productive. If you're like a beefsteak type, a meaty beefsteak, big beef is very popular and Roma is a very popular paste tomato. Okay, everybody's got their own special preferences. I, my preference, if I could just grow one, I would try, I would grow orange cherry tomatoes. I especially like sun sugar, this is sun gold. And actually in the beginning, I wouldn't grow these type of tomatoes because I always kind of felt like they didn't look like they're ripe. But after enough gardeners convinced me to try it, I did and they were right. It has a very intense flavor and fruity. It's, and it cracks less than most cherry tomatoes. So I would encourage you to try a orange cherry tomato. I think you'll really be delighted about it. And if we have time at the end, I, I would love to hear about other tomatoes that you guys like. That's so nice thing about these forums is just by, by seeing all these questions and comments, um, I, I'm learning a lot and I'm sure everybody can learn about from the experiences of others. So I, I can't wait to find out what tomato varieties you like. As far as the varieties that I'm really excited about this year about, these new varieties, first is Big Beef Plus. So again, Big Beef is a great beef steak. And now Big Beef Plus, it resists more diseases. It's sweeter and it has more a redder interior flesh. So this really looks exciting to me. And another one that I'm really excited to try is Mountain Merit. It won the All-America Award because it's reported to be the best slicer or sandwich tomato there is. Uh, it's a, from the Mountain Series. 
Those have come from the mountains of North Carolina and they take cool temperatures and the mountain series resists a lot of diseases. Really looking forward to growing this one. Yellow pear, a lot of us have grown yellow pear. That's a, that's a, once you grow it once, you'll never forget it. It's a giant bush that's loaded with these mild tasting fruits. This year, I'm going to try some of the old fashioned North Dakota varieties. And one is called Fargo yellow pear. And it's a cross that we made in, in, uh, at Fargo. And the, the, the vines are less vigorous and the fruits are a little bit bigger. So, and there's other, uh, varieties developed in North Dakota, made for North Dakota, like Cheyenne and Allstate and Cannonball. And we're going to be testing a lot of those this year in our trials. I'm not a fan of heirlooms in general because I think heirlooms are heirlooms. We moved on. Heirlooms are generally speaking not that productive. They're not reliable. They're susceptible to a lot of diseases. They're thin skin and they crack easily. So, but still heirlooms have good flavor, good taste, good flavor. And I think a strong trend now in, in uh, tomato breeding is trying to breed tomatoes that, that look like heirlooms and taste good, but have more disease resistance and are more productive. And I think the chef's choice exemplifies this very well. It's won a lot of awards and there's all kinds and there's orange chef's choice. There's, this is the bicolor type that was just developed. There's red, green and black one and pink one too, but you might wanna try these for a, a very flavorful variety. Okay, let's talk briefly about fertilizing. Uh, nothing really that special about tomatoes. Uh, General speaking for gardens, we put about a pound of 10, 10, 10 for every 100 square foot to get it started. The second number, the phosphorus promotes root growth. And so some of our uh, commercial growers, when you plant your tomatoes, they'll plant, first they'll plant them a little bit deeper than what they were in the cell pack because tomatoes can form roots along their stems and then give them a drink of a phosphorus fertilizer to get them to the root quickly. Um, then as far as tomatoes, you got to go careful. You don't want the vines to get too lush. Um, so I citrus after the fruits are set. Okay. Um, if you did too lush, too, too much fertilizer, you're going to get all leaves and a delayed flowering. So in general, keep your eyes on your plants. I always think that's a good idea. If the vines look a little bit pale and yellow, they need a little bit more nitrogen. But if they're very lush with all flowers, you got to cut them off. There's, there's too much nitrogen going on. And that tell me what's the best thing you can give your plants. And that is your shadow. Spend time in your garden. The best gardeners spend time and they get to know their plants. They, 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 they have like a relationship with them. Say, oh man, you look a little pale or well, something's nipping on you. I better take care of this. So our Native Americans have the same same saying that the best thing you can give your garden is your footprint. Spend time in your garden and you'll be successful. Tomatoes like mulch, it, it accelerates their growth rate. Tomato can be protect from, the mulch can protect against soil diseases. A lot of tomato diseases come from the soil. And like when you splash, when you irrigate them, then that's, that soil, fungus will splash onto the leaves. So if you have a, a layer of mulching between that, that can serve as a barrier. We all know that mulching conserves moisture and some mulches, the reflective types can repel insects actually, because like the reflective types, an aphid's flying down onto the tomato and it sees the sky is reflected on the mulch. And so it sees the sky above, it sees the sky below and it doesn't know which way to go. And so it just crashes right into the mulch and dies. So aphids can be used, can be controlled using reflective mulchings or it's partially controlled. I don't have a picture of tomatoes growing in clear plastic, but I do have it with cucumbers. And this is in Fargo, I saw. And you see the difference. Clear plastic really generates a lot of heat. This tomato vine under the clear plastic, it's about two weeks ahead of schedule of the one right next to it in the unmulched area. You see this, this one's already blooming, but also under clear plastic, you see it's got some weeds going on there and that, that can be an issue. Here's black plastic with peppers. And if you, you gotta have the black plastic like tight 
or taut onto the soil so that it can help absorb heat and bring that to the soil. And you see this helps to control weeds. And studies actually show that the, the light reflected off red mulch will lead to the highest yield of tomato, about 10% higher yield if you use red mulch. So just to summarize, red plastic gives you the highest yields. The clear plastic gives you the more heat. Um, the nice thing about black plastic is you get some heat, but it will stop the weeds. Straw mulch can moderate the temperatures. Usually I like, to, if I use straw mulch, I'll wait until the ground is very warm and then I'll put it on because I want that, the ground to warm up quicker. And landscape fabric is getting popular as a mulch because it's reusable. Trellising can be important for tomatoes. There's pros and cons. The good point is when you get the plants off the ground, you get better air circulation in the tomato patch. You'll have fewer diseases because there's a lot of diseases from the soil and you'll get better fruit quality if you trellis your plants. But on the negative, it, it costs money to trellis your plants and the ground's exposed. So you're gonna have, it's gonna require more irrigation and you're gonna have more blossom end rot. Here's a, a staking plant, just using a bamboo stake. Or here's a, here's a method that I used, a string weave system in which you, you pound a stake between every two plants usually, and then you just wind some string around to act as support. Here's a quick picture of that. And this person actually did the stakes between every plant, but most people do it every other plant. And you just, just wind the, the twine around and it, it supports the plant up, keeps it up. And you just, about every eight to 10 inches, you put a new layer of twine on as the plant grows up. So you might want to try a string weave system. There's been studies comparing different types of trellising. And as far as what's the best way for each, if we found that for earliness, if you stake, that's the best way as far as getting the tomatoes to ripen earlier because the ground warms up. As far as fruit size, also staking does a very good job. But again, you see, you see the thing about sprawling and no trellising really is negative. Doesn't really get the job done. For marketable yield, caging and string weave is a good way to go. Fruit quality, there's, you know, you'll get good quality fruit, any type of trellis system, just uh, not with that sprawling. And the only thing that's good about not trellising is you save money. So there's, there's pros and cons for this. Pruning, pruning is, is not that hard to do. It really isn't. And uh, if you have an indeterminate variety, you've got to prune. And so you got to find the suckers. And usually what we do is for each plant, we want to have two main vines. So one is the mother vine that's in the soil. She comes up, that's, you know, that's the mother vine. And then the other vine is going to be a sucker that's strong. And what I do is I look for the first flower cluster and right below it, there's usually a very strong sucker that grows right, right in that leaf area, right, right, right between the leaf and the and the main stem. And I will use this as my second vine. And then everything below that, all those suckers are coming out, and everything above that, all those other suckers that grow above are coming out too. So look for that sucker just below the first flower cluster. That's usually a strong one that we can keep as a vine. Okay, talk about pest control. I, you know, here's uh, I, I just hate seeing uh, like this is a dust with seven carbaryl dust, and we just don't have that many problems with tomatoes. I would just say really the only guy is this guy right here. This is what I would. This is what is a manduka, the evil manduka, which is this the, the tomato hornworm this is an amazing pest this is a pest that increases in size by 1000 times in three weeks that's like a cat turning into an elephant in three weeks 
just by eating. So it just eats constantly. It eats four times its weight every day, just keeps shedding off its skin. And so when I see a tomato hornworm, what I notice is like when I go out to the garden in the morning, I'll notice, that, oh my goodness, I just, lo- what happened to that tomato vine? I lost a third of it overnight. And then you just look carefully and you can see that hornworm was right there, just had a great meal of tomato vine. And so then I'm gonna get my revenge. That's the, that's the sweet part. So there's different ways to get revenge on insect pests. Maybe you like a slow, torturous death. And so BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, that's good. You spray, you can spray the plant, spray the pest. And when the, when the pest eats that plant, it'll get a stomach ache and it'll, it'll get a stomach ache for two days and die. So that's a nice slow death. If you like to have a quick death, that spinosad is a, is a, will kill quickly and paralyze the pest. Neem has kind of an interesting reaction in that when you spray neem on tomatoes, it will, it, it's a repellent. So the insects won't want to eat the vine anymore. And also neem, if it does eat it, uh, gets a little neem, then the neem causes the insect to not develop. It doesn't, and then it doesn't become an adult, doesn't want to have sex, and it just slowly dies. Just a terrible way to go. Pyrethrin and is a quick is a quick killer. And insecticidal soap, you have to spray the bug itself. For me, what I do, I I believe in the dirty, hairy Clint Eastwood approach to killing hornworms. And that is okay, you just ate a third of my plant. You're gonna make my day. I'm gonna kill you right now. And so I can spray it at that time or dust with carbaryl or use a seven pyrethroid. And then you, then you, you spray the past and you can just fall right. It falls right down before your eyes. And then it has nerve spasms for about 10, 10 or 10 seconds. And then it just dies right before your eyes. So it's like an easy sense of revenge or often what I do if I have a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do. All I do is I step on it. I pick off the hornworm, throw it on the ground, and I step on it with my big foot. That's the end of that. Nice texture to the bug, just kill it right away. That's what I do when it's on my tomatoes or flowering tobacco plants. Those hornworms are there, I just gonna step on them. Nice thing about tomatoes is bunnies usually, they'll eat tomatoes, but not the vines. They don't really like it, so. We don't really have to worry too much about bunnies in the tomato patch compared to the others, but we all know that in the garden patch, the bunnies, the bunnies are not soft and cuddly and huggable, but bunnies are actually evil. They are our enemy. And really the best way to deal with bunnies in the garden is, there you go, that's the lead solution. But if that, another way, if you don't wanna do it that way is always put up a barrier between you and wildlife. That's the best way, a physical barrier, like a fence. And you know, this this bunny kind of, you kind of feel sad for, look at those soft eyes, but actually you should not feel sad for this bunny. This is like a, a garden mobster just plotting his next attack on your garden. So show no mercy to bunnies. Okay, there are not too many insect pests, but there are a lot of disease pests. And this is early blight. And that's a very common one. And I would say one of the best ways to prevent early blight is don't do this. Don't do overhead watering because I always thought this was good for plants. You know, I thought I feel good when I take a shower. So I think they like it when I give them a shower and the leaves are all glossy. But if I could speak vegetable they would be cursing at me right now. They say, Tom, why are you doing this to me? Now I'm gonna get diseased tonight and I'm gonna I'm gonna die from this. And and then I remember when I when I got older, I was my first big job was I worked, I was I worked at a sunflower research place trying to they train they hired me to kill plants. So what I would do is I would they turn on the irrigation at night and then I would I was like the grim reaper trying to kill and I would sp- I would spray rust spores of the plants and our goal was just to spread that disease everywhere so we did it at night with the overhead watering and uh, we hoped to find one plant that didn't have that rust disease so as far as the proper way to water don't use overhead irrigation keep the plants dry irrigate in the morning 
the plants will absorb all the water they need and anything that gets on the leaves will dry quickly before night. You should water deeply, not frequently. When you water deep, the roots grow deep. When you water shallow, the roots are shallow because the roots grow where the water is. And again, mulching can help conserve moisture. Again, avoid soil splash. Again, to wrap it up with fungal diseases, there are resistant varieties. Try to reduce the humidity by maximizing the spacing, the sunlight and the air movement. Don't splash the soil because that's where diseases come from. You can use fungicides that prevent disease like a uh, shield of protection. So chlorothalonil is the common one in every, almost every garden center. The fungicide will be chlorothalonil in the active ingredients or if you're organic, copper can help. And then remove or bury any diseased debris. And like Annie was saying with, with potatoes, rotate your crops if you can in the garden. Got to talk about blossom end rot for a minute. That's such a problem, but this is not a fungus. This is a calcium deficiency that causes the fruit to collapse. Just like our bones collapse if we don't have calcium and so do the cell walls of a tomato fruit. But the thing is, the answer is not to add more calcium to the soil because our soils in North Dakota generally have plenty of calcium, but somehow we got to get that calcium to the fruits. So one thing is, you know, we need the roots to bring the calcium from the soil to the plant. So be careful when you, when you cultivate, you know, tomato roots are shallow, don't damage the, the shallow roots. Try to maintain uniform soil mulcher or, or soil moisture and mulching can help with this. So by doing that, there's always be some calcium in the soil solution for the plants to absorb. And then avoid too much nitrogen because, you know, you may not know this, but like when plants take up calcium, the leaves and the fruits do not share it. They fight each other for it. And so if you have a lot of nitrogen, you have lush plants, lots of leaves, and those leaves are going to take that calcium from the fruits. So that's why be cautious about over fertilization. If you, and that's why again, I only, I fertilize after my fruits are set unless the plants look pale. Calcium sprays, some university studies seem like they work, but sometimes they don't work. So they're not reliable, but if you wanna try, you, you spray the fruits when they're dime size, spray the fruits directly with about four tablespoons of calcium nitrate per gallon of water. Okay, what I always do is I just take, I just spend some time in my garden and I look at that first fruit cluster. That's the one that's most likely going to get the blossom and rot because, because there's just, there's, there's too many leaves there fighting on the plant. You, but usually the subsequent clusters have much less blossom and rot. So if you see a green tomato with blossom and rot, pick it off. Last thing to talk about is herbicide injury. This is my number one question every summer. So how come my potatoes and tomatoes are all curved up, curled up? And it's usually because of herbicide injury. Uh, the herbicides drifted from when the lawn was sprayed for dandelions. But then sometimes people swear, I swear that there was no herbicides used nearby. Then the next question I ask is how about did you put any manure in your garden? Okay, because what we're what's happening is that farmers spray their 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 hay fields or their pastures with these persistent herbicides, and when the and when the horse there eats that that pasture grass, the, the pasture grass is loaded with herbicide, and the and the herbicide does not break down when it goes from the mouth to the butt. And so it just poops out herbicide filled manure. And then when you use that, you can be spreading the herbicide in your garden. And the other common way has to do with lawn clippings. You got to be careful because in the good old days, they said uh, you can uh, use lawn clippings, just mow three times from the time to spray between, between the time you use the lawn clippings for your tomato plants. But today's herbicides are stronger and more persistent. And if you read the label, the label will tell you, do not use lawn clippings for your tomatoes. Otherwise the chemical will, will volatilize on the tomato leaves. 
So I want to thank, give the photo credits. And one last thing is we are testing tomatoes this spring in our home garden variety trials. We're giving out these seeds this week. We're testing a lot of new promising varieties like that Big Beef Plus, and there's a new celebrity called Celebrity Plus. We're testing Mountain Merit and all kinds of, we're doing peppers and eggplants too. If you are interested in participating in the trials, again, we're sending out the seeds right now. You can sign up and go to the, you can Google the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials or just go to this website. You can go to the catalog and order the seeds that you want. We'd, we'd like to have a big team of gardeners testing these different varieties. Okay, with that, I wish you all a happy spring and I am going to stop sharing. Yeah, I see a comment about the Fargo yellow pear tomato. Yes, that is offered by Prairie Road Organic. Prairie Road Organic is, is a, that's, that's a North Dakota seed company. It's taking the leadership role as far as preserving the, the old North Dakota tomatoes of the past. And so they're a great source of seeds for North Dakota tomatoes. I, I order from them myself. That's actually, that's where I got my Fargo yellow pear. We're testing that in our trials this year. Let me get to some more questions here. We answered about uh, growing tomatoes and potatoes on the same, the ketchup and French fries plant. That's just not a good way to go. Okay, someone planted mountain merit tomatoes last year and they were tasty. There's a, there's a question about the nightshade issue. Tomatoes and potatoes and eggplant, they're all in the nightshade family and nightshade can have toxic fruits. And so that's, that's a weed that has toxic fruits. Um, and so because they're in the same family, there, there was concerns that, well, if the nightshades are poisonous, then the tomatoes may, may be poisonous. But it's a different species. And so tomatoes are safe, but don't be eating nightshade uh, weeds. Are there varieties of tomatoes that are higher in anti anthocyanins? Um, there's the, the, the big one that made a big splash was called Health Kick, Health Kick. Um, I personally don't believe in buying varieties that are high in anthocyanins I, because a lot of times they have a bitter taste or they, that's, or their only good point is that they're high in anthocyanins. They're maybe they're low yielding. Um, they taste better like those, uh, we tested those uh, indigo tomatoes and a lot of our gardeners did not like the flavor of them. So I think instead of getting a little bit extra boost with a certain variety, I think it makes more sense to find a variety that you like to eat and just eat more of them and you'll be happier. Okay, someone, so like Sun Gold, so good. Okay, pair it with Sweet Million. Where do you purchase Mountain Merit tomato plants? You gotta, well, you, you go, go to your local garden center and uh, especially the local one might be a good way to go, a local garden center. Like, um, like maybe not the, the national, the national brands. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Mountain Merit locally. That's why we're gonna grow it this year. This person likes Cherry Fox. It's a bigger fruit just like sun sugar. Um, these people like Silets and Saucy Paste. Sun Gold's great. What's a good seed catalog or website? Um, you, have to, you have to be careful recommending. If I could just pick one seed catalog, it's right here on my desk. And that's Johnny Selected Seeds. And I know this is like, maybe you're seeing this reverse, but um, there's a lot of great places to get your seeds, including our local garden centers. But I like the Johnny Seed Catalog because it's a great educational resource. It will teach you how to grow the tomatoes. It'll tell you the bugs that are a problem, the, the diseases that are a problem, how, well, how to space the plants. Um, what's a good grape tomato variety? I, I haven't ever tasted, I, I've never, I haven't compared grape tomato varieties. Um, I can't, I can't tell you what's a great, a great one. Um, this person got a lot of tomatoes, but a few of them ripened from green before the frost. How do you prevent that? These were indeterminate varieties. You got to find an early ripening tomato. Like she tried pineapple and Cherokee purple. 
tomatoes just they want the heat so you could use black plastic to generate more heat but i think start with an early ripening tomato look at, look at your choices when you're at the garden center look to see how many days it is when everybody's got a smartphone go online find out about if you see a variety find out how many days and look for the early ripening types Cheyenne, Cheyenne tomato seeds are getting harder to find and Prairie Road Organics sells them, but the, um, they're actually Prairie Road Organics out of Cheyenne seeds right now, but they're making a big seed increase next year. So you can look for them there. I think Cheyenne has a great reputation. What does heirloom seed means? It, it comes, it comes, it's, it's generally, it's kind of a loose definition, but it's generally a uh, an old variety that's non-hybrid. So you can save seed from heirloom tomatoes. Most uh, tomatoes, tomato varieties will self-pollinate. So you can, in most cases, you can get away with not spacing out the plants too far. Um, so this, you can save the seeds. It's easy to save tomato seeds. You just scoop out the flesh, you put it in a plastic bag and you let it sit uh, under uh, in that bag for about a week, and then you can just flush out. The flesh comes right off the seed. This person also likes the burpee seed. Come, there's so many good companies. Um, don't apply the mulch until the tomatoes start to appear. Is recommendation. That's a that's an interest. Again, the whole idea. Don't put don't put straw mulch until tomatoes start to appear. I support, but there I, there's nothing wrong with using black mulch or clear mulch before you uh, before the tomatoes appear because we want to, go, to warm up the ground. Any specific mulch that you recommend? No, I don't, whatever works for you. Whatever, that's what gardening's all about, whatever works for you. I've, I've used uh, black plastic mulch the most for tomatoes or a landscape fabric. I know it's popular now because it's readily available and it warms up the soil. This person likes Juliet grape tomatoes, me too. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorites, but I, it's gonna be hard to find those plants this year. There was a seed shortage. Does mulching help stop blossom and rot? Yes, because mulching helps keeps the soil uh, moisture in. What's an example of a reflective mulch? These are a type of a silver type of a mulch that, that literally reflect the sunlight so it's a silver-based mulch. It's like a, almost like aluminum foil-ish. Those are mostly used in hot countries, like in Asia. They're not, because we need, the reflective mulch, it doesn't really generate the heat. And we need to generate the heat. That's why the, we use black plastic or the, or the, or the clear mulch. This person likes chocolate cherry. Buffalo Sun is a nice tomato that has a nice uh, Buffalo Sun has a beautiful marbled flesh pinkish orange flesh. This person puts old tires around every tomato plant. Is there anything negative to that? I, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about that because I'd be I'd be concerned about something leaching out of those tires. Why do you have more blossom and rot when you trellis? Because when you trellis, the plants are brought up and the soil is exposed to drying more often. So again, to, to minimize blossom and rot, we have to conserve the soil moisture, maintain soil moisture. So if you trellis the plants up, the soil is exposed more to drying. So you just have to be a better, have to just irrigate more often. How deep do you plant a tomato? You plant a tomato, well, you don't, you don't want to plant it too deep because the ground's cold, okay, in the springtime. But you can get away with planting it just like an inch deep than what the cell pack is because, again, tomatoes will form um, roots along their stem. So just a little bit deeper than that cell pack. Don't plant them down to China because it gets cold. Yes, he's blossom and rot. Where can you find Fargo yellow pear plants? I, I don't know where. Maybe somebody has found Fargo yellow plants, yellow pear plants. This person like 4th of July tomatoes. That's a burpee variety. I've heard a lot of people like 4th of July. This person hates bunny rabbits too. 
oh, this person takes tomato hornworms and beats them with her hoe. Wow. I got big feet, so I just step on them. How big are the hornworms at their smallest? They're just, they're an egg at their smallest. They're an egg. It's laid as an egg. There's a black beetle with yellow or tan spots. Sat beetles. Oh, like a black beetle. Yeah, those are sat beetles or also called picnic beetles. Black beetles with tan spots. And so the way, to, the best way to control them is they're attracted um, to overripe fruit. So the most important thing is pick your tomatoes on time. And if you do have a rotten tomato, don't throw it down on the ground. Pick it up and get it out of the garden. That's what causes sap beetles. They're attracted to that fermenting yeast. This person likes neem oil. Is it better to water like with a, with a soaker hose? Keep the leaves dry when you water. So a soaker hose is great or a watering wand, anything that, or a drip irrigation. When transplanting in spring, should half of the vine be buried? Again, I would just bury a little bit deep and it will sprout better because it's, uh, it forms roots along its stem. Do Epsom salts help tomatoes when planting in the ground? Epsom salts are magnesium sulfate. And um, I, I really don't, a lot of people use them for blossom and rock control, but it doesn't work for blossom and control. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I. I can't say if Epsom salts help. I. I would say I'd question that, but there's only one way to tell you, and with these kind of, uh, these kind of mm, fairy tale solutions is like, you get a six pack of, of tomatoes, and on three of them you put the Epsom salts underneath when in the in the soil when you when you plant them, and three you don't, and see if it makes a difference. Maybe it's better. Maybe like uh, you, you get your husband to do it, and then and and don't tell the wife or the other run, or whether way, don't tell your spouse, and so that way it's a blind study. And then at the end of the year, you both can compare which three plants were the best, and maybe it's the one with Epsom salts. I doubt it. The crushing eggshells help. Uh, eggshells have very little good. I mean, it adds a little bit of organic matter, but the to, for the calcium itself, you'd have to crush into a very fine powder to be available this year. And again, most first soils have enough calcium to begin with. So eggshells are a source of organic matter and it doesn't hurt, but it's not really gonna be a good source of calcium. Same with tub, Tums tablets. Um, I just questioned the, the usefulness of Tums tablets. I, again, work with your spouse and do a scientific experiment. Um, what about the liquid fertilizer agro thrive? Never heard of it, so I can't say, but in, you know, there's nothing wrong. Look at the label, look at the numbers. Like, is it nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium? Is it a balanced solution? But you know, liquid fertilizers can be very effective. They're, they're generally quick acting. Okay, I gotta keep moving. Can wood chips be used as a malt? Wood chips can be used as a mulch, but when the wood chips decompose, the microbes, um, they, need, they need nitrogen to decompose the wood chips. So the microbes will steal the nitrogen out of your soil. So when you use wood chips, you'll have a short-term nitrogen deficiency because the microbes will steal it. I don't know where you can get mountain merit tomato plants. Are there sprays that can be used that won't kill bees? Yeah, I think when we're talking about insecticides, I just say, just don't use insecticides unless you see the pest itself. There's so few insect pests on um, tomatoes, but in general, target for bees, the natural insecticides um, are shorter lived in the environment and preferably spray in the evening hours when the bees are not actively working. How do you control slugs in tomato? Like iron phosphate is the way to go. Uh, sluggo is a commercial name. So that's an organic control. Iron phosphate, escargo is another uh, trade name of that. Read the label carefully. Another comment about uh, when plant, pl 
planting, pick off the leaves up to the top. I think it's a good idea after the plants are well established, the leaves, any leaves that are touching the soil, you can trim those off because that will prevent the spread of diseases. Okay, I promise we're gonna get out of here. Lots of good comments. What nightshade weeds are we talking about? Black nightshade that has these black like huckleberries and there's orange nightshade. This person says Lowe's Garden Center in Minot has mountain merit. We talked about the difference between determinate and indeterminate. What herbicide do you recommend for weeds including nightshade? In a garden, I recommend a garden hoe. That's the best way use a hoe, it gives you good exercise and cultivate shallowly. A black cherry tomato that was at Peace Gardens, probably was, it was probably indigo gem. It's an indigo variety. How about uh, stink bugs on tomato fruits? Uh, stink bugs, again, that spinel set is really a remarkable insecticide. I would, I would look at that first. Just, uh, we want to, okay, can you top off indeterminate vines late in the season? If, if you want to, you can top off indeterminate vines. Okay, that's, that's it for tonight. I want to get you out on time. Uh, just so you know, if we didn't get to all your questions, just fire me off an email. I'll be happy to answer them for you uh, via email. Uh, also, I want to thank Scott for his work tonight. So helpful. And Scott is recording this and we will post these uh, videos on the Spring Fever website. So we'll get those posted in a few days. So if, if you missed anything or you want to tell your friend about a good presentation you saw tonight, then, then you can watch them. Uh, on the Spring Fever website. So this is our first of four Monday nights. So next night, next Monday night, we're going to be going again, 6.30 to 8.30 Central. We're going to talk about landscapes. We're going to talk about some new trees and shrubs that you can find at your garden center. We're going to talk about some common mistakes that people make when they care for trees. And also we'll have a presentation of how to design a beautiful perennial flower garden. So I'm really looking forward to next week. I hope you see you next week on the Spring Fever Garden Forums. Everybody have a good night. Mm -hmm.